to our October 16th council meeting. Our uh, portable microphones aren't working, so we're improvising. Councilman Gary George is gonna lead us in the flag salute this evening, if you'd please stand. Two ceremonials this evening. Our first is a proclamation for lights on after school. So I'd like to call Terry Dawson, our community services coordinator, uh, Eric Trendy, the after school manager with the Chino Valley Unified School District, and Brian Racciellis, executive director of YMCA. Sorry about having to stand up here. It's okay. And the proclamation reads. <clears throat> Whereas on October 25th, 2018, Chino will join over 1 million Americans to celebrate the 19th annual Lights On After School event, a national commemorative of after school programs and activities promoting the importance of quality after school programs in the lives of children, their families, and their communities. The city of Chino is, is committed to quality after school programs for all youth because these programs provide a safe, friendly learning environment boost students' academic achievement, build stronger communities by involving students, parents, business leaders, and adult volunteers in the lives of children. Over 11.3 million K through 12 children in the United States are without supervision during the after school hours, according to the America After 3 p.m. survey, which was conduct conducted in 2014 by the After School Alliance. Members of the Chino Focus on Youth uh, Collaborative, including the including the City of Chino, Chino Valley Unified School District, and Chino Valley YMCA, along with many other youth service organizations, provide significant leadership in the area of community involvement to enhance the education and well-being of Chino's youth during after-school hours, providing safe places for youth to become successful adults. And whereas the City of Chino community believes that every child should have access to safe, friendly place, places where lights are on after school, now, therefore, I, Eunice Emiloa, Mayor of the City of Chino, do hereby proclaim October 25th, 2018 as Lights on After School Day and urge all residents to take advantage of the programs and services that are available to the community. And who would like to hand the proc? Thank you, I'll okay. take it. And if you'd like to come to the... Well, I wanna thank you and the council for our proclamation. We're very, very proud of our after school programs and what we do there. And this is a day that's special that we get to highlight that with our families and they can see what their children are doing um, when they're with us. And we'd like to invite all of you on October 25th between 4 and 6 to visit all nine of our sites if you have time. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. And on behalf of the school district, I'd like to thank the council and the mayor and everybody in the city. We run phenomenal programs. We invite you to come out and visit. We're extremely proud of them. And we've got some awesome kids having fun. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Uh, the Y has been a part of the yeah, Lights on After School program since it started in about 2000. Um, so we're happy to be a part of it again and uh, to be working alongside such great partners. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. You're so tall, Brian. <laughs> My gosh. How tall are you? 6'10. Six 6'10? Ten. Six ten? Wow. <laughs>
Okay, next we have Red Ribbon Week proclamation. Uh, we're recognizing October 22nd to the 26th as Red Ribbon Week, and I'd like to call up Nikki Hendricks, our Community Services Coordinator, Amy Avila, Crime Prevention Spe Specialist with the Chino PD, and Jenny Mott, Nurse and Tobacco Use Prevention Education Grant Coordinator with the Chino Valley Unified School District. Nikki's always so calmly dressed. <laughs> <coughs> But usually she has all these different colors in her hair and things sticking in it. Okay, whereas alcohol and other drug abuse in this nation has reached epidemic stages, it's imperative that visible unified prevention education efforts by community members be launched to eliminate the demand for drugs. On behalf of the citizens of Chino, I am pleased to join the Community Services Department, Chino Police Department, and Chino Valley Unified School District in an effort to reduce drug use by proclaiming, by proclaiming October 22nd to the 26th, 2018 as Red Ribbon Week. The City of Chino works closely with the Chino Unified School District to offer quality prevention and education programs for youth, such as Project Alert, a substance abuse program designed to give junior high students an understanding of the negative effects of drugs, as well as actual skills for resisting peer pressure. And whereas the, the Chino Police Department provides crime prevention outreach, which includes safety presentations, activities, and educational materials on topics including drug and alcohol awareness at local schools in the city of Chino in support of Red Ribbon Week, and to encourage students to say no to drugs and strive for a positive future. Now therefore, I, Eunice M. Yaloa, the city, mayor of the city of Chino, do hereby proclaim October 26th, 22nd to the 26th, 2018 as Red Ribbon Week, and urge all residents to take advantage of the programs and services that are available to the community. Nikki, right. you'd like to say a few words? Thank you, Mayor Yaloa, and thank you to the council. Uh, another thank you to the police department and the school district. Uh, we couldn't do it without them, and we look forward to our continued partnership with them. Amy? Good evening. Um, on behalf of the Chino Police Department, I want to thank uh, all of you for your support in education and prevention. Uh, we will, and we're very excited to be visiting a few uh, schools this week, um, actually following next week, and providing brief presentations and red ribbons for our students. Great. Jenny? Hi, I wanted to um, share with you the good news we had this week, or this last week. We um, received uh, 93000 extra dollars from the state with the Prop 56. Um, funds. Those were the tax on uh, tobacco and um, vaping substances. So our budget was approved so that we're going to be spending a good chunk of the money that we're really excited about and working in collaboration with the city employees, um, with our health science teachers, our digital media teachers, and the students. So this is advocacy for them. So these kids are going to design, they're going to film, they're going to edit, and they're going to produce PSAs on um, tobacco, on vaping, on uh, marijuana, and all the different drugs. So these are going to be great when they're by the students, for the students. And if you want a preview, because one of the teachers got so excited that he actually, um, him and the students actually made one. So if you look on our um, district webpage, you see a kid in a, um, a track um, position and it's a whole PSA on that so I'm really excited to see that and hopefully then maybe at the end of the year we can share a couple of the PSAs with you at another meeting so can we you. link that with the city or can we the sure could link to it? Uh, we that sure would can. be really great okay, okay. Thank, thank, you. thank you thank you all for being here Apparently my phone's not on silent, so I'm trying to find it. It's been buzzing. Oh, it's buzzing. It's not ringing? No, no, okay, ringing. no problem. Okay. Do you ever have one of those days where you're just not, I mean, everything's discombobulated? Well, today's the day. Let's see. Okay, our attorney's going to report out of our closed session that was held earlier. 
Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the council and audience. The city council met in closed session to discuss the two items on the closed session agenda, namely conference with legal counsel existing litigation, first matter Madrigal versus city of Chino. City council held a discussion, mm -hmm. received an update to the status of that litigation matter and no further reportable action was taken. Item B is FHL II LLC DBA Frontier Communities versus City of Chino. Um, the City Council received an update on the status of the uh, four <coughs> listed cases and um, held a discussion. No further reportable action was taken. That concludes the report out of closed session. Okay, thank you, Fred. Next item on the agenda is public communication. This is the time and the place for the general public to address the council on issues that are not elsewhere on the agenda. Uh, we can take action on anything that's not on the agenda, but we can hear your concerns and perhaps, perhaps um, direct staff to take some kind of action. Our first written request to speak is from Mr. Lynn Wells from Cavalry Chapel, Chino Hills. Uh, this is a request for an invocation, so I'd like to invite all those who would like to participate to please stand to join us. Daniel says in second, in second chapter of Daniel, he said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his, and he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings, and he gives wisdom to the wise, knowledge to those who have understanding. And Father God, today we pray that you would provide wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Many things will be discussed, and God, many things may might be settled. But Father, we ask you to rule and reign over decisions, over hearts, over requests of your people. And God will give you the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Mr. Wells. <clears throat> the next written request to speak is Okay, I think it's Suzanne Forward? Howard. Howard. There's a lot written on this piece of paper. <laughs> Sorry. Mayor Uloa and council members, <clears throat> my name is Suzanne Howard, and I'm from North Minister Presbyterian Church in Diamond Bar. And I came here to uh, make a brief announcement of an upcoming event. We are going to be having a panel discussion on the current face of homelessness. And we would love to invite the council, council uh, Mayor Uloa, as well as members of the audience to our, uh, to our event on Saturday, November 3rd, from 11 to 1.30. Um, we have a wonderful opportunity. By, our, by launching this discussion, we hope to, to um, begin a, a discussion with uh, about homelessness in our communities and what we can do to eradicate that uh, that situation and help you know be help of help to the people that find themselves in that situation um, the we are very very fortunate to have the fall uh, members from the inland valley hope partners coming to speak to us from pomona Volunteers of America from Pomona, Project Chella from Chino Hills, Purpose Church from Pomona, and the Sheriff's Department from Walnut and Diamond Bar. So I hope that each and every one of you, both in the audience and our council and our mayor, uh, will be able to attend this event. Thank you. Suzanne, where is this being held? It's being held at um, North Minister Presbyterian Church at 400 Rancheria Road, in Diamond Bar. Okay, thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you. Okay, those are the only written requests to speak that I have. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to address an item that is not on the agenda elsewhere? Okay, then we have um, 
something that we do here at every council meeting, and that is we always have a lot of students in the audience that are from high schools, sometimes colleges around uh, for class requirements. And so we invite you to come to the lectern, give us your name, the school you attend, your grade, the class you're taking, and your teacher's name. That way you're on TV as you can prove to your teacher that you were here for credit. <laughs> so come on up. It's mandatory. Yes. <laughs> you, don't, you don't come to the microphone. Well, attention. call your teacher. <laughs> okay, I'll go. Okay. okay, so my name is Angie Aguayo. I go to. Pull that a little bit closer to you, Angie. No, this. Pull the microphone. Oh, there you sorry. Go. Okay. I'm really short. <laughs> okay, so my name is Angie Aguayo. I go to Don Lugo High School. I'm a 12th grader. Um, I'm doing this for my government class, and my teacher is Mr. Pope. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Rigoberto Rosales, and I'm a 12th grader at Don Lugo, and I'm doing this for my history, uh, my Gov class for Mr. Pope. Okay. Hello, uh, my name is Dave Flores. I'm a 12th grader from Don Lugo High School, and I'm, my teacher is uh, Ms. Carpentier, U.S. Government. Thank you. Hello, my name is Michael Duarte. I'm in the 12th grade. Um, I go to Don Lugo High School, and I'm doing this for my teacher, Mayor Carpenter. Hello, mm -hmm. my name is Jose Ramos. Uh, I attend Don Lugo High School. Uh, I'm a senior, and I'm doing this for my government class with the teacher, Mr. Pope. Hi, my name is Dakota. Um, I'm in 12th grade. I go to Don Lugo, and I'm doing this for my government class for Ms. Carpentier. Hi, my name is Cody. I'm a senior at Don Lugo High School. I'm here for Ms. Carpentier's class at U.S. Gov. What's your last name, Cody? Cody off. Okay. <laughs> Thomas, I'm 12th grade at Don Lugo, and it's for my government class for Mr. Pope. And your last name, Thomas? Contreras. Okay, thank you. Um, hello, my name is Ricardo Garcia. I'm here for my, because this is 1% of my grade, uh, for my U.S. government class, and my teacher is uh, Ms. Carpentier. Thank you. Good thing you remembered your teacher's name. <laughs> Hello, my name is Denise Reyes. I'm a 12th grade. Um, my teacher is Ms. Carpentier, and yeah. <laughs> and your class? Oh, oh government. Government, okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Priscilla Corona. I'm a senior at Don Lugo, and I'm doing this for my government class for Ms. Carpentier. Hello, my name is Joseph Suarez. I'm a senior at Don Antonio Luga High School, and I'm doing this for my government class, Mr. Pope. Hi, my name is Mirka Garcia, and I'm a senior at Don Luga, and I'm doing this for my government class, and my teacher is Mr. Pope. Thank you. Hello, my name is Ashley Neri, and I'm a senior at Don Luga High School, and I'm doing this for my government class, with, and his name is Mr. Pope. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you for all, be, all for being here this evening. Okay, next on the agenda is consent calendar. We're pulling item number six and sending it back to staff. Do any council members wish to have any items pulled or does anybody in the audience want to have an item pulled? Okay, seeing none, then a motion would be appropriate. It's a motion from Councilman George, second from Mayor Pro Tem Howie, and the item passes four yes with one absent, that being Mr. Elrod. Okay, next under public hearing is item number eight, resolution of necessity to acquire easements and real property for Pine Avenue right away from Chino Corona Road. This is to consider the adoption of a resolution of necessity to acquire easements and real property for Pine Avenue right away from Chino Corona Road to a point approximately 300 west of Meta House Avenue and related drainage and access easements. Uh, I'd like to open the public hearing and then have our staff report from our attorney, Mr. Fred Galante. Yes. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the council. Um, <clears throat> what you have before you is a resolution of necessity to acquire easements in real property for Pine Avenue right of way from Chino Corona Road. Um, the uh, process before you is uh, for the city council to consider acquisition of a right of way so that uh, Pine Avenue may be expanded to its ultimate width. The, um, the 
Lewis Operating Company has obtained development entitlements for development of residential units. Um, among the development conditions is a requirement that they dedicate and or acquire for uh, and widen Pine Avenue from China Corona Road to a point approximately 300 feet east of Meadow House Lane. So the, uh, the, this particular area is required for that particular widening. Lewis has made a good faith effort to try to acquire this particular easement, but has not been able to reach an agreement with the property owners, uh, HRB Properties, LLC. As such, Lewis has requested per the uh, government code that the city provide assistance in acquiring this necessary right of way. The, uh, the city has considered this uh, and issued a written offer to acquire the property and that offer per the uh, condemnation rules reflected the full fair market value for the acquisition of that particular easement. That was presented to the property owner on uh, September 6, 2018. Um, the offer was also reiterated in a, in a follow-up letter on September 28th when uh, the city also notified the property owner of this particular hearing to uh, consider this uh, resolution of necessity should the property owner be unwilling to uh, enter into negotiations for the acquisition of the property. Um, so uh, per the requirements of the eminent domain laws, uh, the city has issued that notice of this particular hearing, um, informing the owner that it has a right to appear at the hearing and be heard on the issues that the eminent domain laws uh, allow the property owner to testify on. The, uh, the, the city did receive some letters from the property owner and the property owner's counsel objecting to the particular resolution, the consideration by the city council of the resolution of necessity. Um, if the owner or their representatives are here, uh, we can turn it over and have them testify. And I'm happy to respond to all of the allegations. The, the letters have been circulated to all the council and they're available for any interested person to review. They are part of the record. Um, for the reasons I, I will state in providing them an opportunity to speak, I disagree from a legal perspective on their arguments that uh, either the notice, the offer was insufficient or somehow our appraisal was uh, inadequate and I can um, provide you that information uh, at, the, at the time following the testimony. Okay. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions or it would be appropriate to proceed to invite the owner to testify. Okay. Prior to calling Mr. Bartholomew um, up, are there any count, uh, council members that have questions right now? Okay. Then um, Kevin Bartholomew, would you like to come up, sir? Good evening. My name is Kevin Bartholomew, and I'm speaking on behalf of Daniel Bartholomew and HRB Properties, LLC. In a telephone conversation on September 28, 2018, Dan Bartholomew informed Matt Ballantyne that HRB Properties wanted to retain an appraiser and would require additional time comparable to what the city have had to have the appraisal performed, approximately two and a half months. Matt Ballantyne stated that he understood and also requested that we send a letter indicating our intention to have the property independently appraised. We sent this letter on October 4th, 2018. The city was aware Dan Bartholomew was out of town between harvests at the time of sending their offer. HRB did not receive the offer and appraisal until September 18th. HRB was only given 10 days from the time of receiving the city's offer until the city sent another letter indicating its intent to consider adoption of a resolution of necessity authorizing condemnation. This was surprising as we understand that the city is obligated to give the property owner an opportunity to have meaningful negotiations with the city before seeking to condemn private property. In the same letter, we also requested the city's project engineer 
to contact Dan Bartholomew to coordinate a time to discuss the city's plans for relocating the water wells and irrigation systems that will be affected by this project and to forward to us any plans or permits prior to the meeting. Water is vital to HRB's farming operations at the site. The fact that the city has not discussed its plans for the relocation of the wells and irrigation systems and that they were not valued in the city's appraisal is concerning. We also requested the city's project engineer to contact Dan Bartholomew to coordinate a time to stake and mark all the areas included in the offer. As stressed in a phone call to Matt Ballantyne on October 12, 2018, and a follow-up letter on the same date, it is very important that Dan Bartholomew is contacted first to coordinate a time as we will need to be there to let the city onto the property. On October 11, 2018, HRB again sent a letter to the city with the hope of conveying that we would like to be given the opportunity to negotiate in good faith. And again, we asked the city to discuss its plans for relocating the water wells and irrigation systems with us. In fact, to this date, we have yet to receive any plans from the city relating to the relocation of the water wells and irrigation systems that are vital to our farming operations. Late yesterday afternoon, on the day before this hearing, the city's attorney contacted our attorney to discuss her intention to provide dates of availability for a meeting about the wells at some unspecified time in the future. This is the first time that the city has made contact with us concerning a meeting about the wells. As of yet, no meeting has been scheduled. Given the incomplete offer and appraisal by the city, and in our desire to negotiate and work with the city in good faith, we requested this hearing to be postponed. We believe we should not have to negotiate with only a copy of the city's admittedly incomplete appraisal. We also notified the city that given the pending legal deadline and that we had yet to receive a reply to our previous letter, we had asked our attorney to draft an objection letter to be included in this proceeding, which was sent to the city on October 11, 2018. We are also surprised by the city's sudden and aggressive actions relating to the project, given that we have tried to work constructively with the city for many years. I will now bring up copies of the above mentioned letters to be included in the record. Thank you for your time and consideration. Are there any questions? Uh, you can provide the letters to Angela. And Matt, you and I had a conversation today about time frames. Do you or Fred want to go through um, what has transpired over the last six or eight months? Okay. Yeah, just a quick summary. I mean, he, a lot of the letters that he's referring to is in the packet that was included with the attorney. We, we initiated the whole conversation back in June of 2008. There has been an exchange of letters. June of 2008? Uh, 18, I'm 18. sorry. 18, okay. Um, there has been conversations. Typically, before I had sent out any letter, I had contacted and had a conversation with uh, Dan Bartholomew. Um, there were a couple of communications where Kevin was, was also present in that discussion. Um, a lot of the most recent letters, like the request uh, for the engineer, um, meeting with the engineer, that came in the October 4th letter. Um, I know that they had conveyed, Dan had conveyed that he was away on, on September 10th, um, was on vacation, um, but the letter was sent um, uh, notifying him of our intent to, to kind of move forward with this. Um, and then when he returned, that's when we started to exchange these letters that he wanted his appraiser uh, again, on the October 4th letter, he requests uh, for us to have a discussion uh, as it relates to the wells and staking. Um, we've had, uh, again, our, we received uh, the letter. I know the letter was submitted on uh, Friday. I was out of the office and I received it Monday morning. Um, and I directed our legal counsel to reach out to their attorney to have a discussion as it relates to the wells. We are working on um, a date and time to have the engineer out there and have it staked. In fact, there were dates uh, that were some that, that we just came up with that we're going to be submitting uh, to the Bartholomews. Um, so we'll have that discussion. It's my understanding that this resolution doesn't preclude us to continue to have the discussion, and certainly it's our hope that uh, 
we'll be able to resolve this matter. Um, but uh, this is kind of the first step, just kind of declaring the purpose of the resolution of necessity is just to declare the, the need um, for this land. Now, um, you had mentioned that Lewis had been, um, I don't want to say, well, I guess attempting to work with the Bartholomews for quite some time to come right. to a resolution of, of the property that they need to widen Pine. How long had those conversations been taking place? Um, I know that those conversations predated our initial letter to the property owner that uh, the city intended to appraise the property. That letter came out, in, uh, as Mr. Valentine mentioned, in June of 2018. Uh, Lewis, I know, has been working with trying to reach the property owner and trying to receive a response and, and enter into negotiations at least, I would say, three or four months before then, I don't know if uh, staff has a better indication of that, but I would say several months beforehand. So l leading up to this particular action, there has been a, a, approximately half a year of prior notices and, and information to the property owner that this is a required condition of approval and the, the dedication is a necessary dedication to yield that ultimate right of way. I will add that uh, I know, I don't know if the speaker's done, but uh, the, uh, the comments made about the relocation of the water improvements, th those are completely separate issues to the extent they have any relocation costs and damages. Those issues are not issues that c are to be provided in an offer letter or addressed in a, the resolution of necessity. That all happens after uh, in the uh, understanding the plans and uh, um, working up the information as to whether those pro uh, items may be relocated and how they're relocated is a completely separate process than what you have before you today. Um, what you have before you is, is an attempt to stop any further delay of time so that this project does not face further delays. Uh, there is still an opportunity for the property owner to secure an appraisal. Um, our appraiser actually looked at the correct valuation of this land, which is agricultural land. The, the uh, doctrine under eminent domain law is called the Porterville Doctrine that makes v uh, abundantly clear that this portion of the land is to be uh, appraised based on the current um, uh, zoning of that property. So uh, we believe the appraiser looked at the right valuation. And what is um, the current zoning? So we understand it's open space. Open space. Uh, so okay. uh, agricultural open, open space type uses. The, um, it, and Mr. Valentine's correct. This council's consideration and, and if it wishes adoption of a resolution of necessity does not foreclose any discussions between our office and their legal counsel, your city staff and their representatives. It's, cer it, it, it's certainly, a, um, typical for that to happen when a city council considers a resolution of necessity. We don't have to run into court tomorrow and file the complaint that uh, the resolution of necessity authorizes, but we are happy to sit down and we have made it clear to the property owner that the city will uh, offer the statutory amount for an appraisal. So the city would reimburse them up to $5,000 for an appraisal. So. Uh, for their own appraisal. Their own appraisal, correct. Okay. So they've had every opportunity to know that this was coming since at least back in June when the city uh, initially sent them that notice of intent to appraise. So Now, relocating wells um, so that they continue operations and stuff is also our responsibility, correct? Correct. That would be something that would be uh, probably undertaken by Lewis as part of their development, but that would all be planned out as, uh, as was stated. It, the the area is going to be staked for the exact area of the take, <coughs> as well as um, the planning for the relocation address before uh, any construction or any activity start. And the, and the necessity for this land um, is, is pretty apparent. We've got to widen Pine Avenue. 
Yeah, and, and, it, and it is a legal obligation of Lewis Operating Corp to get that done, correct? That is correct, and uh, this, in fact, is in your uh, general plan circulation element that the ultimate right of way for this, pro this thoroughfare is um, a six-lane highway, and so that is what the easement area would accommodate. Uh, it was initially included in the specific plan back, I think, in 2003, uh, and that uh, th that requirement for the particular road was incorporated in your uh, general plan amendment in 2008, the circulation element. So this has been in the plans for, for many years. Okay. Mr. Bartholomew, do you want to uh, make any final comments before I open it up for public comment? No, thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. It, it's We do need that piece of property, you know that, for Pine Avenue, and we don't intend to act like big government that comes in and not give you fair market value and you know hinder your agricultural operation but at the same time you know the traffic mess down there and we have to widen that street. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone else from the public that would like to address this item? Okay. Seeing none I will close the public hearing. Council members have any comments? Mr. George? Well, you, I mean, you stated it. The necessity is to widen pine, and we need this. That's, what, that's why the resolution is here. And that one more clarifying point. The, the time clock, so to speak, um, this, this triggers official action by the city to declare publicly that we need that piece of property. But as long as we're in open negotiation and honestly moving forward with the property owner, there isn't like all of a sudden the clock's going to strike at midnight one day and then everything's done. Isn't that correct? No, as I mentioned, we do not need to rush into court tomorrow to file the complaint. Um, as the speaker, Mr. Bartholomew, explained, our, my partner reached out to his attorney already and has had initiated a dialogue. We're happy to continue to that dialogue so long as it does not prolong the schedule too much. Uh, we're obviously happy to work with them. Uh, and avoid any uh, litigation if uh, th there is a time element actually to the, to the extent that uh, when you file an eminent domain action, the, the appraisal has to be very current. Uh, once it becomes stale, the judge will have you, you know, reappraise it. So we, we certainly don't want to wait until we get, um, we, we run afoul of those timelines, but that does not mean that uh, there's not an opportunity for negotiations. Okay, thank you very much. No, I, I wanted to uh, dovetail what uh, uh, Gary had said that, yes, uh, Pine Avenue is very vital for, for mm -hmm. the traffic. It's gonna get worse, so we need to get that settled. Absolutely. Mr. Halley? Yeah, just a quick comment also. Wi the widening of Pine Avenue is so crucial to that area and the growth that's gonna happen in the next few years, and, and this is not, this isn't anything that's new. It's been known for years that we're going to need to widen this uh, piece of property, uh, the property. We're going to need that uh, right away. So I think it's important that uh, negotiations continue on and we move in the right direction. Okay, thank you very much. So with that, then um, I would entertain a motion for approval. Motion from Councilman George. Second from Mayor Pro Tem Howie and the item passes for yes with one absent. Next item is item number nine, Appeal of Planning Commission Action Approval, PL 16-0772, Site Approval and PL 16-0773, Special Conditional Use Permit. This is Appeal of a Planning Commission Action Approving a drive through Farmer's Boys, Farmer Boys Restaurant located at the southwest corner of Euclid and Kimball Avenue. And our staff uh, report uh, will be provided by Mr. Warren Morleone, planning city planner, and Mr. Dave Hammer, civil engineering manager. Prior to their staff report, I'd like to declare the public hearing open. Gentlemen. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council. Back on August 20th, the Planning Commission approved a Farmer Boys drive through restaurant and multi-tenant building at the southwest corner of Euclid and Kimball Avenue. This is an aerial of the location. 
specifically at, uh, on the project site, the Farmer Boys is at the south end here, and this location has a drive-through, and then the multi-tenant building is on the west side of the site with two access points, one on Kimball Avenue here in this location, and then one over here off of Euclid Avenue. During the public testimony at the Planning Commission meeting, Mr. Mark Russell and Mr. Omar Roman spoke in opposition of the project due to traffic safety concerns associated with the project. At the hearing, staff addressed the concerns and explained that traffic movements were studied and no foreseeable safety issues were identified as a result of the project. No other issues were brought up at the meeting and ultimately the Planning Commission approved the project. Then on August 28th, Mr. Russell appealed the Planning Commission's action to approve the project based on traffic concerns. Uh, Mr. Dave Hammer, our um, civil engineering manager, is here to help me this evening and go through those specific issues with you and provide some answers to those. So with that, Dave. Good evening, Mayor Yola and council members. The traffic-related issues brought up during the hearing and included in the letter presented to the Planning Commission include uh, four major items. I'll list those now. Um, it includes the potential conflicts for the project's Euclid Avenue driveway, which is located here um, in proximity to the existing Chino de Salter Authority driveway, which is immediately south of their proposed driveway. The um, second item is potential for rear end collisions with inbound vehicles from southbound vehicles on Euclid Avenue or from westbound left turning vehicles on Kimball Avenue due to the proximity of the project's Euclid Avenue driveway to the Euclid Avenue and Kimball Avenue intersections. So, we scroll out here and look at the, the overall intersection. We're talking about southbound movements along Euclid Avenue and westbound movements that would be turning left that might c conflict with vehicles at the driveway here. Third item is potential for broadsiding collisions of vehicles exiting at the same driveway on Euclid Avenue due to the line of sight and the speed of vehicles turning westbound to southbound at the Euclid and Kimball Avenue intersection in front of the project site. So item three has to do with vehicles exiting Euclid Avenue driveway and possibly being broadsided. And lastly, um, there's a potential for rear end collisions with vehicles conducting left turns in and out of the project's Kimball Avenue entrance. So there's a, let me go to the overall site plan, this driveway right here, um, is something that they identified as potential uh, conflicts with uh, turning vehicles there. So the developer's traffic consultant, Urban Crossroads, has prepared a letter responding to these concerns. Additionally, we have discussed these concerns with the Chino Police Department. Please note that inbound and outbound left turns will be prohibited at both driveways. So we'll have right in and right out only. Euclid Avenue is a state highway. Caltrans has reviewed the applicant's proposal and has approved the location of the Euclid Avenue driveway and overall intersection geometry. In summary, the response to the concern are as follows. So regarding the Euclid Avenue driveway and the DeSalter Authority driveway right here, the um, DeSalter driveway there has a gate that's um, blocked almost all the time. They rarely use that entrance. Their main entrance is on Kimball Avenue, so we see very little possibility of conflicts between movements at these two driveways. Secondly, uh, the California Vehicle Code requires drivers to maintain a safe distance to a vehicle in front of them. Vehicles turning into the Euclid Avenue driveway will be decelerating either before or within the intersection. So if we have southbound movement along Euclid, or vehicles turning from Kimball Avenue left onto southbound Euclid, they'll be decelerating to enter the driveway. And this gives uh, ample time for a second driver that would be following that vehicle to slow and avoid a collision. Additionally, the outside southbound lane on Euclid Avenue, uh, generally in this area right here, is approximately 24 feet wide. 
which is enough space to allow a southbound vehicle to pass on the left side of an inbound vehicle. Uh, thirdly, based on engineering analysis, we have determined that the vehicles turning right out of the Euclid Avenue driveway will be afforded ample line of sight to southbound Euclid Avenue and westbound left turn Kimmel Avenue vehicles, and they must wait until a gap in traffic occurs. The normal operation of the traffic signal will, will provide the needed gaps even during peak hour traffic. And fourth and finally, the, regarding the Kimball Avenue driveway, there'll be proper signage that will prohibit left turns at Kimball Avenue driveway that are an enforceable violation of the vehicle code. So PD can issue tickets if, if uh, drivers attempt to drive into or make a left turn into that driveway or turn left out of the driveway. There are other driveways along Kimball Avenue already that include these signs. Additionally, the raised pork chop located in the middle of the driveway, which is a raised median type uh, uh, device, will be a significant deterrent to drivers who may want to turn left in or out of the site. For these reasons, we believe the project design presents no significant traffic hazards and we recommend denial of the appeal. This concludes our presentation. We're available to answer your questions. The developer and their traffic engineer are, are here as well. Okay. Thank you. Um, prior to calling up the applicant, uh, do any council members have questions of staff? Gary? Oh, yeah, we'll be able to talk afterwards. Okay. Then I would like to call up, um, have a written request from Mr. Joe Minio. Is that correct, Joe? My name is Joe Minio. I'm with uh, the Farmer Boys Company, uh, the development company for Farmer Boys, um, and the property owner. We're also here with uh, Carlton Waters, our uh, traffic engineer from uh, uh, Urban Crossroads, who has done extensive work in this area of Chino, too, and is familiar with the intersection. I'd just like to let you know that uh, the company purchased this property approximately two years ago. Um, and after meetings with the city. And in the process, we've had uh, three uh, design review committee meetings. Uh, we've met with Public Works on two occasions to discuss the, uh, the layout and the traffic issues. Uh, we've worked with uh, Caltrans for over a year uh, to uh, have them approve uh, the access on uh, Euclid Avenue and to get their support. And uh, once we had that approval, then Public Works and the city planning has suggested that uh, we would start working with the city to formalize our plans to bring the project up to a planning commission level. And uh, we've also met with uh, de the DeSalter Authority uh, two times to discuss our project and the driveways interaction and a common fence along the uh, south property line, and we have their support too. And uh, so all this was prior to our uh, planning commission meeting and, and approval. And uh, I'm here to uh, answer any questions and Mr. Waters is here also uh, to answer any uh, technical questions that you may have in regards to the, uh, the uh, traffic uh, studies. Okay, thank you. Any questions of Mr. Minio? Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Next written request to speak is from Mr. Stubby Barr. Thank you, Mayor. I have no objection to the project. I think it's a great project. I just would like to point out a couple of items. There is a blue line on page 185 uh, of the channelizing media and the pork chop. Um, the wrong design vehicle has been used. This pork chop is going to uh, leave throats, openings that are too wide to, people are still going to turn left into them. Uh, we have the same issue on three recent projects that we've done and it has not slowed them down. This design vehicle is a single unit 40 truck, which is the largest turning radius of all the design vehicles. It could not possibly fit or maneuver on the site. So a uh, more typical design would be an SU-30 which would allow uh, 
tighter radius and close the throats so that it would be almost impossible for someone to turn left from Kimball onto the site. Secondly, um, this is designed as a street intersection, not as a driveway. Uh, it appears to show a crosswalk in the easement. This is not in the right of way. This would be in the pedestrian easement. The correct application at a driveway is for the sidewalk to continue through because pedestrians maintain the right of way. It's no different than a driveway at your house. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm assuming that Stubby has or is working with the city on these issues? Is we have not discussed these issues directly yet, but these we can talk about blue those lines if you like. New. The blue lines are new. Blue. Oh. So, um, yes, we have discussed with the project applicant the type of vehicle that would be used to deliver um, food to the store. I think you mentioned it would be a, a bobtail type truck approximately 30 feet. So I think we can um, accommodate the, the comment there. We can reduce the driveway width so it only allows for that size vehicle. We don't expect any type of semi truck to be entering the site at all. So we can narrow the, the driveway okay, for I'd that appreciate purpose it. in final design. Okay. Um, I'm not quite sure the, the double bold line shown on the site plan, are those pavers behind the driveway? The, the, the driveways are intended to be our standard commercial type driveway, not like an alley entrance or a street. So in other words, the sidewalk will remain in the general plane of the, of the sidewalk on either side of the driveway. There'll be no dip down with ramps, that type of thing. So I think maybe the double lines on the site plan might be pavers. They're, they're not a crosswalk. Okay, so those are the limits of the decorative pavers behind the driveway. Behind the driveway and the apron area. And outside the right of way. Yeah, yeah so I, I think the way it's shown on the drawing could be confusing and, and misinterpreted. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I have one more written request to speak, and that's Mr. Mark Russell, who is the applicant. I believe that's the appellant, oh. uh, just for a correction. Oh, sorry, appellant. Thank you. Uh, evening, Council Members. Um, I'm Mark Russell with uh, Chino Valley Auto Care. Um, I have <clears throat> a peer review that I've done that I'd like to submit um, for comment and review. You can provide it to our. Should I? I don't know whether we've seen it or not. There's several copies, yeah. In the review, we addressed some of the deficiencies in the initial uh, traffic study. And we're asking for a second look on it and to table this until that's done so. Hey, um, Mr. Russell, you're a project manager for Park Crest Construction. What is Park Re West? <coughs> Park Crest. Park Crest. We're, uh, the gentleman I work for, he owns several companies. Um, one of them is the Chino Valley Auto Care. Um, sorry, the Arco next door. Arco, okay. Uh, uh, adjacent to the uh, project, not next across door. Across the street? Across the street. Okay. And we've, we've reviewed it and we we're looking at the, uh, the traffic and we have safety concerns that we had brought up and we're just a continuance of that and we actually did a, uh, <coughs> sought a consultant, uh, Vince Scott Green and uh, our law and Greenspan and they've done the peer review. So if you go, we can go through it step by step or if you take your time to we'll review it, if you'd like to address it. Has staff seen this document? We just finished it. You just finished it? Yeah, and then I had, uh, was reviewing, I went online and I had reviewed your letter and the comments and one of the other things I'd like to address is, it doesn't state that there was Caltrans approval, it actually just says that there was no comments from Caltrans. And we, we experienced quite a bit of uh, 
review with Caltrans on our site, so feel further review with Caltrans is necessary. Any staff comments or Ms. Galante? Um, so typically, if I may, Madam Mayor, members of the council, when documents such as this are you know, delivered at the time of a hearing, it's very difficult to analyze all of that. You could certainly ask the, app, the appellant to summarize it. The other option is you could uh, hold this over for a few minutes while the staff maybe can skim through it and see if it changes any of their opinions. Um, it, th those are generally the two options that, that are before you. So yeah, that it's I rather difficult when something comes in the very night of the, the item to Council, uh, questions, comments? Um, yeah, when did you, because uh, I was at the Planning Commission meeting, when did you uh, decide to challenge the, uh, the Planning Commission ruling? When did we decide it? Yeah. I, I don't have a date for you. I don't know. When it was, when there was, it was pretty soon after the Planning Commission meeting, right? Uh, I'm sorry? It was, it was soon after the Planning Commission rejected uh, your, your yes, proposal yeah. that evening? Yes. And yet, uh, we're receiving this just now. Well, we we had a contract with them to get a review, and it, it actually took it was it was difficult because a lot of people don't want to do peer reviews. Um, I don't know if it's a, a standard in the industry, but we sought several different consultants, and most of them wouldn't even consider it. And we work with several consultants, and some of the consultants, we, we've never worked with this particular consultant, and other consultants, they just had no interest. Okay, um, as long as I open that one up. The, uh, I, I, like I said, I was at the Planning Commission meeting when, uh, when this was presented, and, um, and heard your, you know, your objections. Um, the, the only, one of the questions I have is, you just brought up that you said that Caltrans didn't give any approvals, and I'd like that clarified. Actually, what I said was in their they letter. Used, I'm sorry, go ahead. Actually, what I said was they stated that there was Caltrans approval. I stated in the letter received from Urban Crossroads that it didn't state that it was approved. It stated that it's not. there was no comment. Caltrans had no review, no comment. Okay, can I get a clarification on Certainly, yes. We, we did meet with Caltrans, and we worked with Caltrans over about a year period, as the developer had noted. Um, Working with Caltrans is generally a two-step process. It's, uh, it's similar to the process we have at the city. There's a, a planning level, which this project ended at planning commission, and then there's a final engineering level. So at the planning level, they call it an IGR, intergovernmental relation process. That has been completed. So at a planning level, Caltrans has no further comments, meaning they've accepted the project. There is still an encroachment permit that needs to be obtained, and that is done through final design construction drawings, where they're looking at the, the minutia details of how things are going to be constructed. But from an overall concept, they've accepted this design. So it was, it was accepted? Yes. Thank you. Um, some of the issues that came up at the, uh, at the meeting, I didn't, hear, I didn't hear Stubby come up, but some of the issues that came up uh, were the left turns, which as it looks like it has been, it was mitigated then, and it's still mitigated. Uh, and one of the problems that you brought up was that the uh, there was uh, excuse a, me, which which left turn, sir? The left turn was on uh, of Kimball, going in and out of out of Kimball. From Kimball onto uh, southbound Euclid. No. No, no. The left turns going out of the out of this uh, out of the lot uh, onto Kimball. I mean, where you cannot make a left hand turn going on uh, to Kimball, and people right going on, right people going out. west on Kimball can't make a left turn into the into the unit. Into the into the uh, property. Oh yeah, for, uh, across the uh, double yellow line. Okay, so that's that was there then, and it's and it's still there now. Yeah, that hasn't. Yeah. The um, and is one of the other issues that you brought up was uh, people making a left hand turn westbound on Kimball, making a left hand turn to go southbound on Euclid. Uh, you were worried about them running into cars that would might want to go into the into specifically the, the line of sight, which is also something that uh, needs to be addressed in sequestration. There okay. Have been a the but that, but that they were, that, that the uh, during the uh, planning commission meeting that was that was uh, that was answered also, and I thought I thought adequately at, the, at that at that meeting, because of the fact that there's enough room 
for them to you know, get into the, the far right hand lane and then turn into the uh, into the uh, farmer farmer boys. And the, the determination there was enough room was done how. The, per, the, the people making the left hand turn yes, have enough room to get in safely over to the right hand side to get into the get into farmer voice. Okay. And that's and that you said basically. We're talking specifically did. about line of sight. So to make a determination, you'd have to have at least a model or oh. something to show that. Okay, but one of the one of the reasons that that the that the planning commission stated was if you're going the speed limit, if you're you know following the law, that's that's not going to be a that's not going to be a safety issue. And I'm assuming that still, they we're still having the same, uh, we, we still feel the same way about it. Well, according to staff, traffic looked at all of that and it was all yeah. right. Okay. Now, the only question is that was brought up tonight was the 24-foot uh, the lane. Not, not my only question, but this question. The 24-foot lane uh, was safe for, uh, for passing? Yeah, so as... Does that, does that include trucks? Because there's a lot of trucks. Oh, there. sure, certainly, certainly. So if they're southbound or left-turning trucks, they would tend to stick to the inside and leave the outside, which is usually the shoulder area for vehicles that are um, getting off the thoroughfare, if we will, and pulling into the driveway. And, and may I add to the, the, the traffic engineer, the developer hired, studied that line of sight issue, and he's got numbers within his report that, that talk about the length of uh, line of sight necessary to have time to make the churning movements, and it shows that there is enough time to uh, to have time to make the decisions and make the movements necessary to avoid conflicts. Okay, thank you, Mr. Rodriguez. I have a question with that. Did they provide a model? Did they address the queuing at the left-hand turn and provide a model? I really don't understand your question. The the, the issue I thought was vehicles that are exiting the driveway but uh, vehicles exiting or pulling in and the line of sight the the problem is the staging at the left hand turn i actually took a photograph of it of the there's a lot of semi traffic for the amazon warehouses and the problem what we've experienced what we've seen there is as they queue on the northbound euclid to make a left hand on to kimball the queuing from kimball to make left south on Euclid uh, blocks all of the entire site. You, you can only see the very corner. So if you're making that light or if you're even from a stop, because okay. I was at I, a, I understand okay. now what you're saying. You're saying that the, the trucks or vehicles there is no line of sight is what going I'm northbound to make a left turn block the line of sight of the westbound left turn vehicles. Correct. So the, the study provided by Ringwood Crossroads looks at the distance necessary to make the call whether um, you're driving in a safe manner and you have time to stop or divert, that distance necessary is less than the distance that the gentleman I think is talking about. If you're queued up for westbound left turn and you are looking at the driveway, let's say, that distance is greater than the distance you actually need to see. So once you start making the term, turn and you're into the in intersection, that queuing on the northbound will not be blocking the line of sight. Okay. Okay, Mr. Rodriguez. Uh, what I understand is um, uh, the document, according to our city attorney, uh, is, is just received it. So I think uh, we should table this till he has time to review it. Um, if I may, there is no need to continue this to another date. All I suggested was maybe a, just a brief re recess to allow perhaps the uh, converse consultant to. Uh, or a crossroads, pardon me, consultant to review the analysis and see if that changes any of the opinion. Okay, um, we could probably do that. Um, what I'll do is suspend this item. We'll go ahead and go with council and mayor reports and then we'll come back to it. So the hearing, public hearing will remain open. We're just moving on to another item to yes, provide the and opportunity. Then we'll come back to it. Oh, it sounds like he can speak now, oh, Madam okay. Mayor. If All right. You're okay, proceed. Hi, I'm Carlton Waters from Urban Crossroads. Uh, been before you folks many times in the past. Uh, the study that was performed uh, prior to the entire environmental review open comment period and then the approval planning commission hearing uh, was approved by city staff and uh, was not an issue that was raised during the planning commission hearing. 
And as I look through this letter, you know, it comments on the aspects of that traffic study that uh, was begun in 2017. At the time that the traffic study was being prepared, the traffic counts used in the study were less than one year old. It's one of the comments that are brought up in this uh, peer review memorandum that has been prepared here uh, subsequent to the environmental review period being closed. And so uh, the counts were not out of date at the time that they were prepared. Um, there were a lot of comments about the minutia of the methodologies used in the traffic study. Um, the traffic study has been reviewed by city staff based on my going just to find the most current study and, and bring it with me tonight uh, at least you know, two or three times uh, prior to approval of the study and the methodologies, which are uh, a lot of the items that are brought forth in this peer review letter that's just been presented to the council tonight. There was one item that uh, does directly address the issues that were raised at the Planning Commission hearing and the subsequent appeals letter, which as we were talking about is the ability to see you're at the driveway, leaving the site, getting ready to turn on to Euclid, and you want to look to the left to see if anybody's coming so you can safely make your right turn. Um, the comment that's been made as well, there are big trucks that make that left turn and they're sitting in that left turn lane waiting to make their turn. You can't see all the way over to the far side of the intersection and people that are in that left turn lane westbound getting ready to turn on to Euclid. Um, they're making a turn. Even if that light's green and they're coming through, at which point, if you're a person sitting in the driveway, you're saying, okay, here come the left turners. I can't go now. They're coming. But it's, there was one late left turner coming through. The top speed that they're going to reach to make a left turn is about 25 or 30 miles an hour. And the final exhibit on this report is that site distance exhibit that addresses the issue. And basically, the exhibit says that if you're going 25 miles an hour, you need to be able to see 175 feet away to make the decision whether you can turn or not. And the exhibit that the uh, appellant has provided says that there are actually over 200 feet of site distance available to see that oncoming traffic. So they're essentially supporting the point we made in our re uh, response letter that there is, in fact, adequate site distance. But you'll see the vehicles in the middle of the intersection. They're still over 200 feet away. OK. Any questions? Oops. OK. Thank you very much. Okay, um, Mr. Howie, did you have a comment? Uh, just a few comments. I think uh, I know this has been in progress for forever, <laughs> at least a couple of years uh, that uh, we've been looking at something down in there. I mean, it's a much needed restaurant down in the area. I mean, there's nothing really there except for the Arco station. They're the only ones that are really complaining about this particular project, which probably is probably pretty from a competitive standpoint is probably if, pretty understandable. If I may interrupt, sorry. Um, before we provide comments, it was uh, I think the public hearing should be closed first. I'm not sure if I heard that. Well, we're still going through the council comments, and then I was going to see if the appellant or the applicant had any further comments and, and the public. I haven't invited the public yet. Okay. I'm before, going through I, the steps that you provided, Fred. Right. Before we actually opine on the on the the, the a appeal before you, I would recommend, if there are questions, this would be okay. the appropriate time, but. Oh, just uh, questions. Okay. Okay. questions, no, no questions. Comments. No questions, any more questions? Okay, then do either the applicant or the appellant have last comments? None, okay. Anyone from the general public that would like to address this item? No, okay. Now I'm gonna close the public hearing. Now, council comments. Now you can do your comment. Continuing? Okay. Because I have to mind Fred, and Fred gives me the outline. That's that true. I, I understand that. I understand. Follow, you see. Okay. Well, I, I just think that um, we need a project like this down here. It's been two years. I can only imagine going to Caltrans for a year. Uh, Caltrans is very difficult to deal with uh, since they have no comment about it. basically means they approve the project. And, um, and, the, and this, this, um, this recent uh, last-minute review here uh, I think most of this we just got uh, most we just got a six page one from the attorney and, and almost everything that was in that is pretty much in this also so um, um, I, I just don't see you know us not moving forward okay okay any other comments okay then I would entertain a motion okay. 
A motion from Councilman George. Second from Mayor Pro Tem Howie. Please vote. And the item, the item passes four yes with one absent. Okay, next on the agenda is Mayor and Council reports. Okay, with Halloween just around the corner, I'd like to give everyone one last reminder of some of the family fun events we have in our community. First, for all of our parents out there, this Saturday, October 20th from 9.30 to 11 a.m. at the Chino Community Garden, located at 5976 Riverside Drive, we'll be having a free pumpkin carving event and workshop. Here, all the participants will have an opportunity to socialize, enjoy harvest-themed activities, and decorate or carve a pumpkin. We only ask that you please bring your own pumpkin. We'll provide all the carving materials. Although this is a free event, space is limited, so please reserve your tickets. For more information, please call 909-334-3478 or email us at healthychino at cityofchino.org. And lastly, make sure you mark your calendars for the annual Halloween Spooktacular happening on Wednesday, October 31st, this time at our very own Ayala Park, located at 14225 Central Avenue from 4 to 8 p.m. This is one of our most anticipated events and includes a variety of fun activities, including games, trunk or treating, I think it's trunk and treating. Anyway, costume contests and much more. For more information, please call 909-334-3258. And then the events that I attended since our last council meeting um, on October 3rd, I attended the Omnitrans and San Bernardino County Transportation Authority Board of Directors. Also that evening, there was um, a forum on the Newcastle disease that affects uh, chickens and uh, feathered um, animals uh, in the quarantined area as well as all around this area. So um, I urge you to please Google Newcastle disease and learn about this very, very deadly disease. It can be devastating economically. Very, very important that you follow the rules. Do not take any kind of feathered fowl off of your property, whether it be um, a little bird in your house or chickens or turkeys, whatever. Do not move them between properties. Very, very important. Quarantine area is basically from um, Mission down to the 60 freeway between Gary Avenue and Mountain Avenue. Let's see, and then also that evening was the Chino City Council Candidates Forum, which I'll comment on. On the 4th, it was the Infrastructure Committee meeting with myself and Mr. Elrod. On the 9th, uh, Councilman George and I and City Manager Ballantyne attended PAC 205's meeting for the Boys Arrow of Light Badge. Um, we were basically there to answer any questions they had. It was, it was really a fun event and very, very well attended by the kids and parents. And then on the 11th was the Watermaster Appropriative Pool Meeting. Now, I attended the Council Forum, uh, which was very, very interesting. And I'm not going to talk about any particular um, candidate, but there's something that I really feel is very, very important to state. And that is some candidates are running on premises of problems with the school district. Either a school was not um, built or not updated or whatever. And I really, really want the public to understand. The Chino Unified School District has an elected board of educators. And that board of directors is responsible for everything having to do with K through 12 schools, whether it be the buildings, um, the teachers, the programs, all of that, that is not the responsibility of the Chino City Council. You have elected officials on the school board that are supposed to take care of your problems, not the City Council. Uh, we're responsible for public safety, police, doing our part for fire, um, streets, street lights, um, fresh water, providing water to you so you turn on the tap and the water's there. Uh, making sure that there's sewer capacity, all of that sort of stuff, and plus some programs. But we are not responsible for the school district. So desiring to be on the city council to take care of school problems, the school isn't going to take care of your policing problems. 
I have never heard a school board member say they're going to hire another policeman or take care of the fire department. We have definite responsibilities between the two governing bodies, and so concerns that you have regarding education, K through 12, belong with the school board not to city council. I just, I want to set the record straight. It just drives me crazy. We've had candidates in the past run on platforms that have nothing to do with the city, or they claim to be able to accomplish um, items, like we had one candidate wanted to use the water fund to set up childcare facilities. Well, for one thing, the money collected for the water fund is for the water system, and if you misuse that and use it to build childcare facilities, that's jail time. You can't, you can't collect money for one thing and then use it for something else. So they're really, I really encourage the public, you know, look at your candidates for whatever position they're running for and understand what the responsibilities are for that position. And, and if what they're claiming they want to do is doable or even legal. So um, I'll get off my bandwagon, but it just drives me crazy to have people claim to want to be on um, a, a particular board or council to take care of something that's not even our responsibility. School board's not gonna hire police, they're not gonna fix your streets. So don't come to the city council and expect us to build schools. We don't zone the property appropriately to earmark it for those buildings to be built, but if the school district decides not to build it, I mean, the school district gets millions and millions of dollars from building fees and school fees and look at your own property tax bills. Um, it's not the city's responsibility. Anyway, okay, get off my bandwagon. Mayor Pro Tem Howley. Well said, Mayor. Well, it drives me I, crazy. Uh, I was in the audience uh, for that candidate forum and I was thinking the same thing, but uh, you said it eloquently and, and absolutely right. And speaking of water, um, I did attend the uh, C Chino DeSalter Authority board meeting on October the 4th, nothing really major to report there. Uh, also attended the fire district's board meeting on the 10th of October. And interesting thing uh, was a presentation of a public-private um, helicopter service that the fire district will take a look at it, doing a study where if you, you know, something happens and you've got to go out to Loma Linda, a helicopter, you know how traffic is, mm -hmm. can get you to uh, in, a, in a real emergency situation much faster. So I, I believe the fire district is going to look at that and study it. Um, and, and, in, and in many areas, um, uh, medical helicopter services is, is crucial to getting somebody who's in a, in a, who has an accident, heart attack, whatever, in an, in an immediate situation that can be very, very uh, viable. And, and actually what happens is if you do that kind of a, a partnership, I believe the helicopter is painted with, uh, with the logo and everything of the fire district. So it's, it's interesting to we'll see how that, how that pans out for the fire district. Yeah. Then I attended the San Bernardino County <coughs> Transit Authority Metro uh, study session on the 11th. And then, uh, to, then I have one other thing is the Chino Valley uh, Seroptimus are having their uh, annual bingo on October 22nd. That's next Monday night at 6 p.m. at the Senior Center. So if you're interested to come out and have some fun with the Seroptimus, uh, they only seat 200, so you, you better get there early uh, and come on out and have a good time. And all that money that they raise goes right back into the community uh, for all the great projects that the Seroptimus, if you don't know what a Seroptimus, it's a, it's a woman's organization similar to a Rotary or a Kiwanis, and they, uh, their mission statement is to help women and, and, uh, and girls uh, through their all the different uh, things of life. So that's all I got, thanks. Okay, Councilman George. Thank you, Mayor. Um, on the third, I uh, attended Coffee with a Cop uh, at the Starbucks at the, uh, at the Spectrum. Well done again, a lot of, uh, lot of uh, community people came in and it's, it's always so much fun to watch them uh, uh, put a child or they have the parent put the child on the motorcycle and turn those lights on and they just, they get such a, a, such a thrill out of that. So it's, it's a great event. Uh, that evening, the Candidates Forum. I want to compliment the uh, the Chamber of Commerce. I thought they did a fantastic job with uh, um, setting it up and, and uh, running it, and I thought Will Fleet did a great job moderating, so kudos to that group. On the uh, fifth, uh, I attended the Senior Club birthday celebration at the sen Senior Center. On the ninth, uh, chaired the uh, CIM Oversight Board meeting and the CIW Oversight Board meeting. 
Um, on the same, same day, went the, uh, I attended the Chino Police Department welcoming and swearing in ceremony. And um, the, uh, uh, that evening, I was also mentioned the, the Cub Scout event. It was, there were Cub Scouts there, Weevilists there. Uh, Cross Point Church, uh, Boy Scouts were there for their government service merit badge. And uh, they, I mean, they were great questions. There were, there were tough questions that they asked us. I mean, were the, the toughest one was whether we wanted uh, pineapple on, uh, on pizza. <laughs> pizza. So it was, that, was, that was a hard one to answer. But this, this started off with, I think, one, one den. I think it was like maybe nine or 10 uh, uh, Cub Scouts. It's 205. At 205, and it turned out to be, there were like over 60 Scouts there. And it was just, it, it, was, it was a great evening. And there were really a lot of very good questions besides the pineapple question. On the 11th, the, uh, I went to the, uh, speaking of Seroptimus, to the Seroptimus board meeting. And uh, one of the main reasons I went, besides Karen, was the um, uh, Chino Police Department's presentation uh, that uh, Chief Comstock and uh, Lieutenant Kelher uh, talked about um, the, uh, is it the, R the RCC? RTCC. RTCC as well, and then and the license plate readers. And one of the, just one of the stats that they brought up uh, was the fact that since January of 2018, there were, has been 66 vehicles that have been stopped and 88 arrests. I mean, this, this thing is, is fantastic. We only, we have 13? 13? 36. 36. Okay, yeah, so that was the intersections. The, um, and uh, with 36 more, just, you know, just think how that can, you know, that can escalate. Uh, the, on the 13th, I uh, went to the Chino Valley Historical Society's first annual Harvest Festival in the old schoolhouse. Um, this, I mean, that's, the schoolhouse is an amazing place to go to go visit, but that uh, that was really well done. Also, even in the rain, they just they they uh, had the uh, had the event. Did they um, have the cow milking? Yeah. Uh, if, if, yeah. 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 But they had they had the butter churning. They had all you know all sorts of fun things there. Mm -hmm. And then uh, shot from there over to the Chino Valley Independent Fire District's open house. Well done, as you know, as as usual. The uh, even a little drizzle didn't stop. Uh, they were worried about you know. Uh, attendance, but it turned out to be uh, uh, very well attended. Um, on the 15th, uh, attended the Chino Chamber of Commerce board meeting, and then on the 16th today, went to the League of California Cities Jim Thalman Award meeting, and uh, that's it. Okay, Councilman jo uh, Rodriguez. Okay, thank you. Um, October 3rd, uh, I also attended the Chamber of Commerce uh, forum for all the candidates for the districts one, two, and three. Again, uh, very well done. Very orderly, very timely. It went really quick. Uh, October 4th, the next day, uh, Thursday, I attended uh, the SCAG monthly meeting and in Los Angeles, and the main topic was uh, transportation. It dealt with uh, a lively discussion on omnibus, uh, Metrolinks, and all the, the, the traffic uh, problems that uh, not only Chino is having, but also Los Angeles and Southern California. Uh, October 5th, I attended the monthly uh, senior citizen uh, birthday celebration here at the senior center. Uh, center. Uh, well attended. Always nice to be there and uh, have some cake and coffee with, with all the folks. Uh, uh, October 8th, I attended the <coughs> Chino Cultural Foundation club meeting. Uh, and there will be a play on November uh, 10th, a uh, dinner uh, play on that day, Saturday. Uh, October 10th, uh, I attended the Chino Hills a city Council Forum, which was, uh, let's say, uh, very lively. Let's put it that way. Uh, October 11th, uh, Chino Valley Unified School District uh, uh, Forum here at the community building was uh, very good. A lot of candidates and um, well attended and a lot of discussion with uh, some very key uh, uh, questions that were presented to the candidates. Uh, I must have been following uh, Gary because we were... Uh, after our beautiful lightning storm that we had on, on Friday evening, uh, Saturday was very nice and cool. So we were, I was there at the fire, uh, Chino Valley Firefighters open house, well attended, a lot of activities inside the, the buildings, um, good hot dogs and, and uh, chips. And then uh, following there, uh, I went down and uh, saw, visited the, the old uh, museum house, open house, where they actually had a, uh, a cow, <laughs> fake cow, I guess, milky. And I thought that was very interesting. Uh, I always enjoy going down there. It brings back a lot of memories. Okay. That concludes my report. City manager's report. Yes, first, uh, you know, item number six on the agenda was pulled. 
Um, I want to thank uh, Council Member Gary George for his questions, and hopefully we'll bring that back. Um, next, I, uh, two items. One is I want to in invite Nick Ligori up to introduce our city engineer and then also kind of give us an update on the sphere of influence study. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Council Members. Uh, I'd like to introduce Chris McDoscu. He's our new uh, City of Chino City Engineer. Uh, he'll be working with us in Development Services with the Development Engineering Division and uh, making sure that we uh, design uh, the new components of the community, new streets, sidewalks, and sewers, storm drain, water, um, all of that stuff is under Chris's purview. And so he'll, uh, he'll be a great addition to our team. He comes to us from a number of cities, uh, including the city of Encinitas, Arroyo Grande, city of Whittier, and he is a Chino alum. Uh, he, was, he was here um, over 10 years ago uh, as a project engineer, so. Thank you, thank you, Nick. It's a pleasure to be back, Mayor Ulo. I remember both of you uh, and Mayor Pro Tem Howie when uh, Mr. Elrod's not here tonight, so I get to meet the new council members tonight. I was happy to, I'm happy to be here and see College Park built. Uh, that's one thing that was part of my beginning here was that project getting that off the ground, being here for the EIR and going through all that, and now it's built out, and I feel a little older, but it's great to actually see it built, and we can find all that out. But I'm excited to be here, and I want to thank Matt and uh, Nick for giving me the opportunity to come back and join the team and roll up my sleeves and get to work. Well, we'll come back, but you have no idea how busy you're going to be. Yeah, I'm pretending <laughs> I don't you know. you do. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Just, I just want to make one comment. You were just reminding me when you said College Park, uh, and I forgot to do it on another page, but I'd like to... Uh, uh, kudos to the Public Works Department, the City of Chino, basically, for after that windstorm that we had. I mean, the, the trees, the number of downed trees is, was unbelievable. Yeah. And uh, the, the great job that they did and are continuing to do to get those out of the public right away and to clean up the city is, is fantastic. And I'd like to thank the staff for that. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Councilman Richards. Thank you. Welcome back. Thank you. And uh, then secondly, I'd, I'd like to give you just a brief update on the uh, sphere of influence economic study that is being conducted. So over the past three months, uh, city staff has been working with our consultant team uh, to develop an assessment of existing conditions, uh, looking at uh, what are the current land uses in the area today, as well as the existing uh, intensity of development, looking at uh, what's allowed under the county general plan, looking at what's allowed under the city general plan. I've also done an infrastructure assessment and are completing a market study for the area. And so all of these will com be compiled in an existing conditions report which will be presented to the council in December or January for council input, and then we would proceed to a second phase of, of looking at uh, various options for um, annexations, island versus the whole, um, what those costs would be to the city, et cetera. And we're gonna have workshops on that, correct? Yes, ma'am. So that we have public input and yes. discussions. Great, thanks, Nick. Thank you very much. Anything else, Matt? Well, that concludes our report. Okay. Fred, do you have a report this evening? Uh, yes, thank you, Mike. Uh, Mayor, uh, for remembering me this time. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, I wasn't going to forget you twice. <laughs> um, an issue our office has been tracking are uh, two activities by the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, uh, and one, they've issued an order last <coughs> month that if it becomes effective would severely limit the ability of uh, cities to impose limitations and regulations on what they call these small cell wireless uh, telecommunications facilities. Um, some of the limitations could include uh, taking away cities' rights to um, have influence on the aesthetics of these type of facilities as well as the ability to charge fees for the uh, placement in public areas, public rights of way, and city property. The other uh, FCC action is this rulemaking authority that they're, they've uh, sought comments on to severely limit the ability of cities to receive the PEG fees, the public education and government access fees that cities such as Chino receive for doing the public broadcasting. So obviously we're, uh, 
we're going to inform you and let let you know of opportunities to comment on those uh, those rules before they become effective. But as far as the small cell tower rule that uh, that seems to be moving its way pretty aggressively. Uh, I'm not sure how the league. Yeah, that, that, that was SB 649, right? Uh, these are or rules of the FCC. These are so not the, so the state vetoing laws. of SB 649 right. Didn't, right. doesn't mean anything. Right. Seriously. Yeah, the FCC has just taken a very aggressive position and and claiming federal preemption rights. Oh, on that's these ridiculous. Yeah. I'm not sure what the league, either the National League of Cities or the California League, is doing currently, but I know that they will take positions against them. Well, I hope they're aggressively opposing it. They're, they were, they're the one, one of the main bodies that led the charge to, uh, to defeat SB 649, thought they had lost it until the governor vetoed it. So now they're aggressively doing it again. So, so this we may require national action yeah, through the National, the, uh, League. national League of Cities. Yep. So we could have these refrigerator-sized boxes all over the city on poles. And, and that's a good point. What they term these small cell facilities they're are not small. anything but, yes, nope. correct. Yeah, they're not small. Good heavens. And taking our fees away, too. OK. Thank you, Fred. Anything else? That's, and that's Karen's not here tonight. So Wes, are you it? I, I am it, Madam You're Mayor. It yet. Okay. So, and Chief Comstock asked me to provide an update on our automated license plate reader, but Council Member George uh, already provided that, so I'm going to sit down. And, no, no, you can <laughs> elaborate. <laughs> okay, uh, Councilman George uh, stated it very eloquently. We have 37 cameras on 11 intersections that you, as a council, approved last year. That went into uh, into effect in January. The project finished in May, and since that time, we've We've recovered 66 stolen vehicles and arrested 81 um, different people in those vehicles. And for, for various crimes, obviously auto theft, but also for p possession of stolen, uh, uh, stolen property, identity theft, possession of uh, dangerous weapons. So it's a whole host of crimes that go with these stolen vehicles. And, and I want to, want to share that most of these suspects are people from other cities coming into our community who are getting ready to commit other crimes. Mm -hmm. Our personnel are able to capture them before they do, take them into custody, and uh, make sure they don't come back to the city of Chino. And, and I did want to share a couple of uh, notable cases that, uh, that we've had from, the, from this project. One was uh, a thief had a stolen motorcycle in the back of his pickup truck. I love this and as it's driving through our license plate reader, it catches that license plate in the back of the pickup truck. Our officer is able to locate him. Uh, get him into custody. He's a felon with a stolen motorcycle and a stolen gun. So that's, that's a member uh, or a person in our, our community that doesn't need to be there. Additionally, um, the LPR system alerted on a wanted vehicle from Anaheim that the driver was responsible for uh, committing a, a hit and run and causing major injuries to somebody in their city. So we were able to help them capture that person. And then we had a 72-year-old man who was suffering from dementia who was reported missing by his family members. We were able to find him and safely return him wow. to his family. So uh, it has other aspects besides just stolen vehicles. It's been a game changer for us. We're thankful again for you as a, as a council for approving that. Um, technology really is uh, one of the things that's gonna allow us to continue to be successful. And if you have any other questions about the project, I'd be happy to answer it. Wes, I think one of the, uh, one of the best lines that Lieutenant Kelleher gave to the Seroptimus was that uh, a suspect or a vehicle will come in one side, one side of Chino, a license plate reader gets a hit, it's so quick that they don't make it through the other side, they don't get out of town. And the, so they're gonna stay out of town. If these that's absolutely happen. correct. And our, our fellow uh, communities, uh, Chino Hills is getting ready to bring their system up online and we'll be able to work with them as well. And we're hopefully, uh, Ontario and some of our other communities will get on board too. It would be so fantastic. I just met with uh, Councilwoman Cynthia Moran from the city of Chino Hills, and she was telling me that they're getting on board with the license plate readers as well. But I want to, you know, I want to compliment the entire police department. Um, the officers are outstanding, and, and all of you are thinking constantly of things that you can do to improve our community. And it, it's just, it's so nice to have the team in the Chino Police Department looking out for all of our constituents. Thank you very much, Great Madam job. Mayor, and, and we appreciate uh, your support and working in this community. Thanks, Wes. Thank you.
Okay, Scott, Fire Department's report. All right, good evening, Madam Mayor and <laughs> Council members. So I'll start out, uh, you did give me a challenge uh, last meeting and asked me if I could make sure the weather was not over 100 degrees, so <laughs> we did accomplish that. Unfortunately, it went the other way. <laughs> we had rain and it was probably about 67 degrees, so the, uh, we kind of on a fly, we had to cancel a few things, but we were able to move everything around and it was very successful. And thank you for the, the council members that did come down. We greatly appreciate that. Um, I'd also like to take this opportunity on behalf of the fire department to just talk about Halloween safety uh, for members of the, the public and the residents of Chino. Some things to be thinking about, especially when you have small children out with costumes. Um, we wanna make sure that you are using uh, fire resistant materials so that if uh, the, a child was to become in contact with a flame that the costume would not um, ignite. Uh, we also recommend using reflective tape so they're visible and use a flashlight when going up and down the streets and of course uh, looking for traffic and making sure that you cross safely. And, uh, and lastly, uh, try not to wear any costumes that uh, may cause a tripping hazard or would obstruct your view. So just things to think about and be safe on the upcoming Halloween uh, time. So I'd just like to say happy Halloween to you all and have a good uh, uh, hap, uh, Halloween. So, any questions I can answer, I'd be more than happy to. Sunshine and 82 degrees next year. <laughs> <laughs> it's looking pretty warm. The next, uh, let's look at the next 10 days are all in the 80s. So, yeah. a significant change yeah. from last weekend. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, that's all we have this evening. So, we'll adjourn to our next regular meeting that'll be held on Tuesday, November 6th at 7 o'clock p.m. Closed session at 6 if necessary. Remember to vote. And with that, we are adjourned. <laughs>